Well, let's just go quickly down a number of different business models. Um, and again, this can apply to whichever situation you happen to be in. So I just went, you know, want to put examples that, that I found. A good friend of mine, a guy called Hilton Barber, um, lives and works here, has done a lot of strategic branding work with organizations around. He's got some really good examples around lots of these things. Uh, I've put a few of my own in here as well. But things like the body shop, you know, started in an industry um, in my hometown in the UK, a place called Brighton, where you actually started, and the whole idea of being ethical, environmentally friendly in the cosmetic industry was seen as ludicrous. Actually, what, she, what Anita Roddick started doing was going from the car park downtown Brighton and actually putting the smell along the uh, path from the car park up to the store, and people would smell this and actually just follow it. You know? <laughs> now, did she go and get permission to be able to do that? Is that illegal? You don't care. You know, it's just like, like, don't care whether it's illegal or not. You know, <laughs> like, why wouldn't it be? Um, eventually, got stopped from doing that because if everybody did it, you. <laughs> you'd have a bit of a mess. But, you know, it's just challenging the, the, the status quo. Like, I'm going to do this because I, I believe it. Sponsoring the unthinkable. So Red Bull, Red Bull you know, maybe another fizzy drink. Um, what they've actually done is to match their core value. Back to the whole point, you know, what are we really here for? You know, where extreme mental agility meets physical endurance. You know, that's that's their, their core value. That well, Some people might call it, you know, extra caffeinated, um, you know, fizzy pop. Really? And so what they've done is to match their sponsoring to that. So instead of sponsoring all the usual things that um, you know, the soft drink manufacturers do, they go for extreme sports. Um, you know, unusual extreme sports. They even sponsored that guy who jumped out of that balloon somewhere near the moon. Um, it, those are the things that they would, whereas others would never sponsor that because their core value doesn't equate to it. Um, that rethinking the message, I mean, I thought it was just terrific. The, um, uh, what are they called? The Chobian. Um, strange yogurts. So they bought a craft yogurt factory in New York State in 2005 um, where they had five people and basically they were in the strained yogurt market. Um, it was a 60 million dollar market in the US. It's now a one and a half billion dollar market. 1,500 people employed there. They, they changed the name to Greek yogurts and sponsored the Olympics. People saw all of the health benefits that went with yogurt and all the health benefits that went with, with that. But actually just by rethinking that message and rethink it, you know, it's like 10 times the market size. It's like, like 20 times larger than it was before. Yeah, very, it's a tremendous success story. Um, I like Ben and Jerry's ice cream for, for their crowdsourcing stuff. So, you know, what could be better than, you know, having people help design ice creams? And their, their site was great, actually. But, you know, it was 100,000 people going in there designing, and you had the menu selections to pick off, and the winners went to the Caribbean somewhere and got the whole thing, you know, and the top 10 then get made. But that engagement is fabulous, you know, and again, in a business model, thinking, how can you engage the audience? You know, how can, how can the, the customer base be involved in what it is that you're doing? Um, choosing what not to do, that's Michael Porter's first rule of strategy. It's not about what you are doing, it's what you're not going to do. Um, and I think Richard Branson was the, the classic one in that. He just didn't like the airline experience and got so pissed off with it. He basically then decided to set up his own airline, went and bought a plane. How hard can this be? bought a plane. Didn't really think it through too well. Um, in fact, one of, <laughs> one of his best quotes was, you know, how do you become a millionaire? It was, you know, start with a billion dollars and buy an airline. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what he did do was to get so far down the route of setting up Virgin Atlantic, getting in there, that what he had to do was sell the music business in order to keep the airline going, and did that, and actually sold the music business at the time when the music business took a dive. So it turned out to be a pretty brilliant strategic move. Um, in, now, as to whether that was foresight or whatever it was <laughs> in behind all that, um, but at the same time, it's choosing what not to do is pretty important. And again, it's looking at the business plan and thinking that is specifically what we are not going to do. This is what we will do. Um, don't fear the incumbent. So that one there is actually one of the ones I worked on in Switzerland. So it was when licenses were being granted to all of the um, um, telephone operators around Europe um, to become the second operator. Uh, and basically we looked at the, the incumbent, which was Swisscom, which was a huge organization and basically dominated every market. And, and just like, there was no way we could compete by being just another telephone company. No matter what they did, we weren't ever going to be able to compete. So we went completely the other way and created an, a, a branded organization, called it Sunrise, didn't call it like Telecom 2 or like they did in almost all the other markets, called it Sunrise, and basically went for the new dawn, um, we set up the network so that it was actually built to do, this was pretty revolutionary at the time, sort of high speed fibre to as many homes as we could get to, set a completely different stage for Switzerland to be able to compete internationally, finance market was important, but also you know, for, the, uh, for the, the people at large. And so actually when it came to the 1st of January when they launched, typically Swisscom had a party at the edge of Lake Zurich 
um, and they sponsored the New Year party. And over the other side of the lake, we had this sun rising from over the other side. Uh, at midnight, you know, with the Beatles, here comes the sun. That was how we launched. It was across every paper in the country. This, this amazing thing. So their party basically got no um, coverage whatsoever. But by having an emotive name and by having a, a, a consistent message right the way through, everybody started thinking, what is this about? You know, there, there's something really happening here. And it gave us more publicity than we could ever have got. So it was really about not fearing the incumbent, but doing something different and also then playing in that market and actually thinking, OK, you know, we can actually do something completely different here. The other thing is, yes, if there is an existing business model, there are big incumbents in the place, but there's inertia in the current model. You know, and, and really, it's a bit similar to not fearing the incumbent there, but you know, Blockbuster and all the rest of it, when I mean, you know, Netflix were coming, you know, the, the, all the signs are there you know, that you, know, you can actually be quite small, but also people like Best Buy you know, becoming an Amazon showroom. It's, a, it's almost an old story now, but it you know, very much is. People can walk in, check prices, do everything like that. You know, there is a, definitely a a model in order to be able to go and compete directly against some huge players uh, and just thinking about what those might happen to be. The other one I'll go to is the, the, the X Factor at heart, you know, the, the, the challenger, the, you know, so like Avis was the classic example of that when um, Ford announced it was going into the car rental business. Um, someone rang Hertz and said, what do you think about that? And somebody just put the phone down, <laughs> you know, we're not making any comment about that. But Avis, you know, had a, a challenger mentality which meant that anybody could speak to the press at any stage about anything. They said, look, yeah, happy to do that. And so the front page of the paper the next day had, you know, Hertz refused to comment. And for the next eight paragraphs, it was all about Avis and what did they think about this? You know, they were saying, yeah, really, you know, sensible thing. Well, that's interesting. We rent their cars. We're going to be buying off them as well. But we also rent other cars. Yeah, so that's maybe where we're going to see some differentiation. But there's all this thought. Avis suddenly shot to number two. <laughs> you know, everybody thought this was the next biggest car hire company. All the other car hire companies didn't say a word about it. And, you know, as it happened, Ford decided not to carry on that business. But by having that challenger mentality and having the right organization set up, it was like you know, anybody can talk to anybody about anything. You know, it actually was one opportunity where they just suddenly had the, the ability to, to go and you know, really get themselves the, the exposure they wanted. Interesting now, though, that Zipcar you know, has been bought by Avis because they couldn't figure out a way of dealing with this. You know? So you know, keeping it, but I mean, as I said, uh, Pepsi as well used to be the challenger and you know, kind of gets a bit stuck in that model now once you start being too big. And I've put even Apple as a question there. You know, where does Apple go next? You know, it was the challenger, everything else in that, but it's kind of like at that stage now. You know, all the core values and everything that's hot there, that's, you know, if you're writing a business plan for Apple now, where do you take that next?